And in fact, it, you say, it does seem to me as though the Himmlers, Bormans, Strikers, and their ilk cannot explain Hitler's success with the German peopler, people. Hitler was sustained by the idealism and devotion, or loyalty, hmm. of people like myself. We who actually were least inclined to think selfishly were the ones who made him possible. Hmm. Yes. Uh, that's, in my opinion, true, too. And um, I uh, quote uh, the Oxford historian Trevor Roper, who said one day, if he finds a solution to the puzzle which Albert Speer is giving him, he has found the whole the solution for the whole uh, uh, Third Reich because the Third Reich was built up by people like me. From your book. But I sometimes ask myself whether there is not some inexplic inexplicable instinct within me that always, whether I want it or not, makes me succumb to the spirit of the times. Uh, you have to repeat it because that's... You, uh, yeah, you... Because the translation is... Yeah, you, you are caught up by the circumstances of the moment. Mm -hmm. and you follow mm -hmm. the spirit of the times. Yeah. Yes, I, I always do it in some way because now uh, repenting and now trying to, uh, to uh, explain what could be wrong uh, is also I al already again in the spirit of the time. You are, uh, does that bother you? No, not at all. Now it doesn't. But, but it doesn't bothers it me that, that I did it in Hitler's time. Oh, it bothers you that you did in Hitler's time. Yeah. Are you concerned that you're doing it now? No, because I feel quite well in this world. I feel at home in this world. You're happy? Not happy, but at home. You say you're, you're not happy, but you're at home. I don't understand. Uh, I can't be happy because uh, I still feel um, as a burden what happened in Hitler's time and even when I said in the beginning of our interview that I feel now a free man because I have um, uh, um, lived through 20 years of uh, imprisonment, I have served my whole sentence, uh, in my, my, my inner feeling is not, is not so uh, okay with this, uh, with this um, um, statement. Um, I, in my opinion, I never can really um, reinstate myself as a free man, that everything what happened in Hitler's time, my whole responsibility, is so large that um, I always will be, uh, uh, have to sacrifice a great part of my life to get along with it. You will always feel the burden. Yes, I always feel the burden, and this will never cease. Finally, these words written by Albert Speer while he was in prison. It suddenly seems to me that in the Third Reich I heard no word more frequently than loyalty. It fell from everyone's lips. They all used it to kill their doubts. But now I ask myself whether loyalty was no more than the rag we used to cover our moral nakedness, our lack of resolution, fear of responsibility, cowardice, all the vapidities that we bombastically called our duty. The loyalty I practiced was a form of lukewarmness. Much too late I am beginning to grasp that there is only one valid kind of loyalty, toward morality. Yeah, I think that's, I just, you know, I think it's hard to say that's not honest and that he isn't trying. But when you speak like this, you are supporting a Nazi. And for millions of people around the world, that is not acceptable. That's why the horror of this is so powerful that it, in some ways, disallows understanding. You know, to say, you understand this, it makes it sound like you're, you know, sort of forgiving it. This is, uh, this is a big, big uh, head problem.
for everybody, including me, as I walked into the villa there in Heidelberg. You know, I wanted to, I mean, here's a human being sitting here. And uh, there are people out there who wonder why I just didn't punch him out. Mm -hmm. uh, and always will. So it's just intolerant of any discussion. I think if we can get beyond this, I think the value of trying to get behind this and at least monitor our judgmental attitude uh, allows us to learn more and understand how this happened and how it could happen again. Just a quick postscript, I guess. Here's a guy that was in prison, spanned out for 20 years. His wife waits with a great sense of loyalty yes. for him. Children had no access to him to speak of. Mm -hmm. He had, I think, five, six. He had a lot of children. Mm -hmm. Did he talk at all about what happened to those relationships? With his wife, his uh, children? Yes, I do. Um, I do recall uh, asking him about that. And, you know, this really wasn't any of my business. Um, and I don't remember anything particularly detailed about it. But as I, uh, to the best of my recollection, there was, I know of no, at least there was no public discussion of any friction at all between Albert Speer and his children, except that he acknowledged that he really didn't know them, having been taken away for 20 years. Did you follow Speer after you finished the interview? Whatever happened to him? Speer died in 1980 in a hotel room in London in the company of another woman. Um, I, uh, uh, it was following, uh, it was, you know, obviously here's a man uh, who for 20 years uh, uh, was reduced to writing his m memoir on toilet paper. And I, I, he probably was in London. I think he was probably in London to sell his book. Uh, and it was his only source of income. And mm -hmm. That's what he was doing. Who the other woman was, I don't know. I'm not sure. What's She's the one that called the desk. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Ultimate. <laughs> this is what they're interested in. Ultimately, the lights shut down, and you reach over, and everybody's grabbing their mics. To, uh, did you have any off-camera kind of a final farewell to Shapiro? What I remember most about the end of the interview, we had a Jewish audio engineer. His name was Fisher, F-I-S-C-H-E-R. And uh, we finally wrapped up, and I turned around. And this guy looked like he wanted to kill Albert Speer. Uh, so, you know, that was my first immediate impression after we finished this 106 minutes. Grueling, it seemed to me, and an eternity, you know, struggling to understand what he was saying. Um, uh, beyond that, it was a handshake and a farewell, and uh, uh, we packed up and uh, took our leave. Do you know if you ever saw your interview? I don't know. I assume Macmillan sent it to him. They must have. I'm sure they did. This is just terrific. And one of the things that I'm accused of is having the ability to segue into virtually everything. It's Robert Jackson. And as a re obviously, we're here today because of your interview with Albert Speer and Nuremberg defendant Jackson was part of that. And then you mentioned a little bit earlier and I got to put in a little plug of how you're proud to be an American because among the things you cited were the Lend-Lease program. And then the it's Worth Department, Robert Jackson as Attorney General, was the individual who wrote the opinion for Frank and Roosevelt, which permitted him to take executive action. So we take full credit for that. Thank you for the plug. <laughs> but, but as Carol's in the process of giving, probably bringing up some of the q and I know that one of the things you, you are passionate about, Jackson, and I, and I learned a lot yesterday about that passion and the fact that uh, this was more 
your feelings towards Robert Jackson was more than just interviewing a guy who was a defendant who was prosecuted right. at Nuremberg. Right. So. Well, uh, awareness of who Robert Jackson was came, like most things, late in life to me. Um, I, I am fascinated with the Jehovah's Witness cases before the Supreme Court. It's been remarked by scholars, more than one scholar has made the point that the Jehovah's Witnesses have made a greater contribution to the shaping of First Amendment law than any other person or institution in the history of American jurisprudence. Um, and by the way, uh, the Jehovah's Witnesses, may they all go to heaven and may the, their God King Jehovah someday return and make them happy. And I wish them well, and I mean nothing personal about it, but I don't know if there is a darker, more joyless religion or faith than the Jehovah's Witnesses. These people go into neighborhoods door to door, knocking on, getting spit upon, getting yelled at, screamed at, doors slammed in their faces, and they keep on keeping on. They also earned the hatred of the vast majority of the American people in 1940. They would not salute the flag. One of the things I do best is tell people what they already know, and I apologize for going over what may be for many of you old uh, material, because as this came, information, this information just, this story fascinates me. I'm waiting for the movie. There's a Pulitzer Prize out there for some author. When in 1940, with America at war, young men dying on foreign battlefields, they wouldn't salute the flag. And comes now this, it, it, the Supreme Court comes down from the mountain, eight to one, uh, what was it? I forget. Eight to one. Eight to one. The only dissenting voice. And if you didn't salute the flag, you were expelled from school. The entire class, I stood, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States. Jehovah's Witness. of the United States, you're in the third grade. Uh, little William Gobitis, in the first witness case, Minersville, Pennsylvania, mm -hmm. held on to his pockets. His sister, Lillian, tells us this, who, by the way, lives outside of Atlanta today. And eight to one, they have to salute the flag and in the months that followed, a thousand, there were a thousand injuries of Jehovah's Witnesses. These people were scum. They wouldn't salute the flag, and especially in a time of war. And the court said you, you had to salute the flag. Following that ruling, the, um, there was a, a castration in Iowa of a witness, Jehovah's Witness. They burned down Kingdom Hall in Kennebunk, Maine. They put a rope around several Jehovah's Witnesses in Wheeling, West Virginia, and pulled them through the streets of the downtown area with people jeering. The American Legion wives would cook breakfast in the morning as the men prepared to meet the Jehovah's Witnesses as they were coming into town to evangelize and do their door-to-door. -door. You know, Jews have high holy days. Catholics have the, Ameri the holy sacrifice of the mass. Uh, Islam, uh, Muslims go to Mecca. Jehovah's Witnesses go door-to-door. -door. That's their faith. And while we were throwing stones at them, expelling Catholic pastors, mandated a boycott of Jehovah's Witnesses business. They were, they were, they, they couldn't feed themselves. They were homeschooling. They lived in attics, but they kept the faith because the God King Jehovah was coming and this is what they were taught to do. This is their faith. The cops would join the American Legion people meeting Jehovah's Witness on the outside of town and beat 
the hell out of them. Over the hoods of cars, clubs, blood, just totally almost killing these people. It's not possible to overstate the hatred that existed for Jehovah's Witness uh, adherents. All right, comes now the case back to the United States Supreme Court. Robert Jackson is now on the court, and he writes for the majority. What was the vote? Well, it was the second, uh, Barnett. Seven to two. Seven to two. We still had two. Two said, no, you've got to salute. You've got to do the pledge. You must do the pledge in order to have order in this country. It is not unreasonable to ask a child to stand and salute his flag. What's wrong with this? Who would not do this? The only person, by the way, who got it right both times was Harlan Stone. We should know more about Harlan Stone. Can you imagine the only one who said, this is a violation of the First Amendment. We cannot force these children to do something contrary to their faith, which says, you shall not pledge allegiance to any thing or any person, any institution, anything but God, but God. All right, comes now the second, and this is where Robert Jackson just dazzled me. Again, to tell you what you already know, his, his uh, uh, flourish was one of the greatest moments, I think, in the history of Supreme Court writing when he said, on the occasion of the second case, seven to two, speaking for the, minor, for the majority, if there is any fixed star in our constitutional constellation, it is that no official, high or petty, shall prescribe what shall be orthodox in religion, nationalism, politics, or any other matters of opinion. Nor may he force to confess by word or deed a belief therein. You don't, Americans cannot be made to believe anything. Americans cannot be forced to believe in the United States Constitution itself. Americans cannot be forced to believe in the United States of America itself. Essentially what Robert Jackson and nine other, you know, I don't mean, they, these are old men looking down over that mahogany bench, seven. And they looked at that, at those children, and they said, you obey gives me a, a chill. That makes me a proud American. That's how, this is how secure we are. We're so secure, we know it's absurd to try it. The, the, the Soviets did that. The Soviets says you can't believe in God, which is like saying don't think of a pink elephant. You know, it's, you know but to, to have Jackson Put it that way. And his reputation for taking all those whereases of all those decisions that baffle non-legal minds and to shape it into a language that is so pure, so economical, and so precise, and so understandable was, I think, one of his great gifts uh, to American jurisprudence. And so, especially at a time like today, when you have a lot of people tripping over their robes, can't wait to God bless this, God bless that, God bless my dog, God bless my cat. You know, you, you can't run for office today without wrapping yourself in God and, you know, uh, uh, with false piety professing your, uh, you know, your, your faith uh, to see, to, to read the Jackson statement in that majority um, makes me wish all the more that he was here today and 
if he were, I know he would remind us, you know, that the First Amendment, far from, far from suppressing religion, supports it, promotes it. We are the most religious nation on earth. We go to, we build more churches, sing in more choirs, throw more holy water, and, and are delivered to our final resting place with more holy smoke than any other nation on earth. And I say, God bless us for it. <laughs> All right. But, 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 you know, to hear the, you know, the, 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 those who are arguing against this are creating a crusade without a devil. The First Amendment promotes religion, promotes the separation, ensures that no, no state official is going to tell your pastor what to say in the pulpit. The First Amendment separation of church and state ensures that no public school teacher will ever fool with your child's mind. And there are public school teachers who are called. They believe it in their heart. And I am proud to live in a country that allows them to do that. But let's not. Let's keep, he calls it rigid. Jackson uses the word rigid when he describes First Amendment uh, ideals and principles. There should be no, you know, it gets tough, you know. I mean, you'll have people out there say, if a, if a public school child sneezes, can the public school teacher say, God bless you? You know, this is tough. This is a very difficult ideal to achieve. But we should, we should celebrate and welcome the nobility of the effort. It makes, it, it, it just ensures. And there's no other nation on earth that has been so steadfast, brave, and stalwart in its attempt to enforce what for millions of Americans is a very, very unfair imposition of the government on the personal freedoms and the, uh, and the faith uh, interests of its citizens. But it's a hard sell, it's difficult, and I've always relied on uh, Robert Jackson's uh, comment to try and, you know, as I've discussed with Madeleine Murray O'Hare, for example, who was my first guest, the atheist. There's no God, there's no heaven, there's no hell. When you die, you go in the ground, the worms eat you, you biodegrade, and you become part of the universe. Well, my dear, all of Dayton fell apart when, uh, when <laughs> Madeline Murray O'Hare said that. You know, but, I mean, I just admire you. Madeline Murray was saying, I don't, you can worship a pet rock if you want to, but you pay for it. I'm tired of paying higher taxes because you get all those tax breaks from your religious so-called, and of course she was... Not, a, not, not the most charming woman. Uh, um, so these, you know, these issues have always fascinated me. I think they're central to the American experience. And I think Robert Jackson did more to help us understand why this is so important than any other person who ever sat on the bench. How do you feel about Jackson? <laughs> and while that's coming, everybody is curious about your spouse. And on January 26, 1977, um, Marlowe was a guest on your program. And at that time, you weren't necessarily an item. What happened? Well. <laughs> You ha I don't know if you have to be Catholic to understand it. Um, Marlo Thomas, uh, when, Mar when I walked into the green room and m met Marlo Thomas, it, it was immediately clear that uh, she was a bad thought. You know, w um, uh, somehow I got you know past the temptation and we did the show and. Um, one thing led to another. 
Uh, I said, it's you okay. know, well, why don't we have lunch? You know, I thought lunch sounded better than, not quite as leering as dinner. <laughs> and they, uh, and we were married in uh, 1980 in, uh, at her parents' home in uh, Beverly Hills. And uh, I didn't realize it then, but in 1980, um, when I said I do, I, I married a hospital. <laughs> um, and now, you know, it's a thrill for me to uh, be out in a public assembly uh, where Marla was not getting an award. <laughs> I carry her plaques now. That's my... Uh, <laughs> I'm beginning to feel like the guy on the psychiatric couch to whom the doctor says, but sir, you are inferior. <laughs> um, um, when, we, uh, when we married, her father uh, said, I haven't lost a daughter, I've gained a fundraiser. <laughs> uh, so it's been like that, and uh, I have a very, I'm married to a very busy woman. She is uh, the... the, the uh, the budget of St. Jude is, it's a million dollars a day just to open the doors at St. Jude. So uh, a, a very serious research hospital uh, that has done some magnificent things. You may or may not want to answer. This is a question which was uh, referred to in your book. Uh, it came up in a different context where Marlo was uh, interrogated by uh, another talk show host uh, about her Lebanese background, and, uh, and, and he was Jewish, uh, as I recall, the, the actual uh, on-air guy, whose uh, name I'm struggling with, uh, who was one of the, in New York City, had asked her about uh, the background and the Jewish relationship, and that just happened to be in your book, and here mm -hmm. we are many years later with this same sort of conflict. Has uh, is, is anything happened? In, in, 20-some years have passed since Marlowe's interview with that individual. And, uh, is there a reflection on that? Well, yeah, I forget his name as well. Um, no, he did make, he, he, in the middle of, of uh, his interview with Marlowe, he said, Marlowe Thomas is a Lebanese or a, a person, and of course, as we all know, those, those people hate the Jews. I think that was the comment. Stanley um, Siegel. Stanley Siegel. Yeah, he was something. Uh, that was a very, very, uh, very painful moment for her, but she really let him have it mm -hmm. uh, at that, and th the guy no longer has a television show. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, not because of that, but... <laughs> Mar Marlo's mother is Sicilian, um, and her... F Danny used to tell his audiences, uh, Danny Thomas would tell his audiences in Vegas, you know, uh, I don't fool around. I don't fool around. Not because I'm a virtuous guy, but because uh, my wife is Sicilian. <laughs> <laughs> he, uh, he said, Danny tells a story about it at his own wedding, his own wedding. He said, uh, I'd be faithful to you, Rosie. I will love you all my life. I will never cheat on you. I will be faithful. I will be with you all the time, and I will never, never, ever defile the vows of our marriage. And he looked over and his father-in-law was in the corner and he was saying, that's all right. Did he ever give you any advice when you married Marlo? Um, no, i tell you what, uh, Danny and I used to, uh, of course I've been to, I mean, I've been at uh, every Lebanese banquet, it seems, in the last uh, 30 years. And I would, I would get up and say, you know, people are always, Danny would be on the dais and all, wall to wall, big ballroom in Beverly Hills. And I'd say, you know, people are always comparing me with my father-in-law. We were both born in cities on Lake Erie. I was born in Cleveland and my father-in-law was born in Toledo. We were both, we both married the most beautiful woman in the world. And all the old ladies would go. <laughs> and we both received many, many honors. My father-in-law was knighted, this is true, by two popes. And I was recently named Man of the Year by transvestites for a better America. <laughs> 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 
Well, um, he uh, uh, he uh, he loved that, of course, and uh, uh, but I can't tell you how much you know. When I was, I used, I told the task force for Lebanon dinner. Queen Noor was there. The the the, uh, the the ambassador from Lebanon, all in Washington D.C. ballroom. And I said, I got up and wall to wall, Lebanese people. And I said, you know, I feel I always felt sorry for people who, in my, when I was a kid, I felt sorry for people who weren't Irish. <laughs> yeah, really, you know, we had we had a parade every year. The whole city came to a halt. Um, all the bishops were Irish, and we had the best music. You imagine me up there with the Lebanese people. When Irish eyes are smiling, and I said, uh, and then in 1980, I married a Lebanese girl, and the music of my life changed. I said, you know, I started sleeping with the light on. Uh, well, Queen Noor went on the floor. I was a big hit. Um, so uh, being able to bounce off one of the um, real comedy uh, Giants of uh, of our time was a a big bonus for me, and uh, I was always tickled to be. It was nice to be able to make Danny laugh. You interviewed a, uh, an awful lot of the celebrities of, of that, that time period. Were there a couple that just got away that you were unable to get on the show, or for whatever reason chose not to? We had Pavarotti booked five times, and he canceled us five times. Oh, my friend, I'm sorry. Oh, my friend, I am so sorry. On the phone. Oh, you, know, I had, you know, an audience this size. Wait, and I'd have to go out and say, ladies and gentlemen, I'm awfully sorry. Uh, Luciano is not here. He's ill. His throat. Uh, so that one, that's one that jumps out at you. If President Bush was sitting here and you had the, uh, the microphone and you had... <laughs> Question. <clears throat> Question. And you had to ask him one question to maybe wrap up the show. What would you ask? I'd say, Mr. President, when you close your eyes, as I've seen you do in church, <laughs> and you pray to the Lord, uh, doesn't the Prince of Peace want you to perhaps acknowledge or perhaps say that you're sorry about the unintended, your unintended consequences of the war in Iraq. Um, and I, you know, I, I'd, I'd want to know why, why it was so important to go after a country that did not attack us. And have you thought of the consequences of this? Um, and have him speak honestly to the issue of the United States Constitution. You know, I think the people who dissent here are the patriots. We're the conservatives. We believe in the framers. Only Congress can declare war. And nobody celebrated the Constitution and defended it more eloquently than Robert Jackson. Um, you know, we've come to a place in our nation's history where all, we are a nation of laws unless we're scared. Uh, I could never understand how you could throw 120,000 Japanese Americans behind a fence in the early 40s. I couldn't, honestly, I just, how could you, how, how could you do this? I am no longer bewildered. It's amazing what you can do if you frighten a population. In the Iraq war debate, of October 2002, Robert Byrd, the longest running, the longest serving senator in the history of our nation, stood to read, a, to read off a piece of paper 
and what he read, to paraphrase it. If the leaders want to take a nation to war, it is a very simple matter. All you have to do is frighten the people, accuse those who dissent of not being patriotic, and also tell them that they're not supporting the troops. And it is a simple matter to lead them on to war. Herman Goering, 1934. Uh, a bird read that from the floor of the Senate during that October speech. The vote was 77 eyes. Essentially, what, what, what the Senate, what the Congress was doing was saying, here, Mr. President, if you have to go, go ahead. They did not declare war, which is only Congress can declare war. Byrd stood to say, James Madison said it, giving the president the power to declare war is too much of a temptation for one man. That's why war declaration resides <laughs> with Congress, not the executive branch. By the way, we haven't, we haven't adhered to that uh, Article 1, Section 8. It's amazing. Oh, the Constitution, it's holy writ. All oh, the awards we give to students who are, it's a, why I'm proud to be an American, the Constitution, the framers, they are our monsignori, they are our clerics, they are the framers, the framers. And when it comes to war, eh. They, you know, it's like, and now they're saying the Bill of Rights. I mean, we're turning our back on the Bill of Rights. The president is claiming that he is the state. He decides what, I mean, Jackson is turning over in his grave. This is hugely consequential uh, for us. And while, and while the drumbeat for war, and all of media, by the way, the Washington Post, the Los Angeles Times, the New York Times, Go, 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 get Saddam, Saddam, Saddam's coming. He's got this, he's got that. Uh, all the while uh, this, that this drumbeat uh, happened, uh, the American populace stood largely mute. And we are reminded again that if we put the Bill of Rights to a vote, it would probably lose. Um, you can't, uh, an abstract notion of, for example, privacy does not hold up against the reality of a physical threat to our well-being. So Miranda, Shamanda, you know, don't even, don't even, isn't even considered uh, to put people in jail for a year two years, three years, no papers, no lawyer, no habeas, no nothing, is tampering with the bedrock of the most fabulous experiment in civilized history. And the document that oversees our civil affairs, the United States Constitution, to turn our back on this when it's, we have so much to sell we have so much to offer. We, I mean, look at the Jehovah's Witness. I mean, this is fabulous. This little kid up against the entire nation's population goes before the highest tribunal on earth. And those nine, eight justices put their arms around this little kid and they put their hand up against the mob of a nation and said, you leave this little boy alone. He's a dangerous man. <laughs> I mean, that to me gives me goosebumps and uh, it's what, just the beginning of what brought me to uh, this wonderful opportunity to meet and share old war stories with the people who make this fabulous center so alive and so contemporary. Thank you. 
I know this individual who wrote this question, but um, if you visualize the movie Network, and I'm as mad as hell, and I won't take it anymore, what's your sense of today's television? Oh. Um, there, <laughs> there's, a, there's a significant political movement underway in our nation, which uh, is a coalition of, of uh, civic-minded, uh, active, politically active uh, citizens who believe that corporate media is undermining our democracy. These people believe that free speech is becoming uh, something that obtains only to people who can afford it or people who own the network. The diversity that we were promised has not really happened and we've had no more perfect example of our problem than the Iraq war. I mean, we had a corporate media which beat the biggest drum for this war. And the loudest drum beaters were people who would never think of sending their own kids to fight this war. Uh, the wars have become, wars have become activities engaged in by old men to prove they're tough, and they send young men to make the case. Um, we, we really aren't ever, we're not going to fix this until service in uh, the military and in combat uh, becomes a multi-class thing where everybody's kid, regardless, you know, if your father could afford the lawyer, you didn't have to serve in Vietnam. Uh, we should have learned then. Th uh, this is, uh, th th these wars are fought by kids who can't get a job, and so they joined the army. And I'm now producing a, and directing a film about a young man who was injured in Iraq in uh, March of, uh, in April of 2004. The bullet entered here. He took a M16 round here from the rooftop, like fish in a barrel, it was in the back of a truck, and it exited T4. If you're an anatomist, you know, that's just below the shoulder. So he is paralyzed from the waist down to 26 years old. Uh, he's against the war. And what we're doing is uh, he thought he was going to Afghanistan. He signed up 913. He wanted to get them too. And he said, what am I doing in Iraq? Uh, a, a wonderful mother who was with him is the first face he saw when he woke up at Walter Reed. Mommy. And they both cried for half an hour. Um, you know, to see this up close, to see what harm really, really means in harm's way, this kid is diapered. He's catheterized five times a day. You know, he sees things across the room. You know, he's in bed and he can't. You know, the closer you get to this, the more overwhelming it becomes. And you begin, and, and by the way, only 5% of us have a primary relative serving in this war. 5% of the American population. That's why we were so rah-rah for this. If there were a draft, we'd have an entirely different uh, attitude nationwide, I'm sure. Anti-Semitism today. You had a chance to interview Albert Speer. That clearly was the plank of Hitler's regime, and yet it seems fairly prevalent today. Do you get a sense of comparative analysis between your conversation with Albert Speer that time period and maybe today? Well, I think, uh, uh, unfortunately, I believe anti-Semitism is always there. There are times when the scab is ripped off more painfully and in fuller view than at other times. Um, so I, in my own as I make my own daily rounds. And uh, part of, spent so much time as part of the media establishment. I've met all, lots of people. As, as Hitler recedes in history, uh, you know, anti-Semitism became less and less something that you would want to acknowledge. So in some ways it's more insidious now than then because it's covert and you don't know where it is. 
That's another reason why we want free speech. You know, let Jerry Falwell talk. Don't shush Rush. Don't shush me. Uh, don't, you know, don't, don't tell people to shut up and sing. This, uh, uh, the First Amendment is, pro is supposed to promote a cacophony of voices. You know, there is no democracy without this. And there's certainly no democracy without dissent. And by the way, all of us should probably uh, work much harder at not calling each other names. You know, how we get there, I'm not sure. But the, uh, it's become venomous. It's, uh, I, I mean, I, I, have, I have felt the heat myself. And it's not pleasant. But, uh, you know, I'm 70 now. I got a little money. And I'm going to pop off. I mean, you know, here lies Phil. He said what he thought. And sometimes he talked too much. He done his damnedest. Speak up. If you don't speak up, by the way, and if you, if you, for example, if you don't think this war is a good idea and you don't say anything, you're wasting the blood of thousands and thousands of young Americans who went to die to protect your right of free speech. You have a responsibility to them, to those who died in past wars, to use it. If you want to use it to support the president, go ahead. And don't let anybody call you names. You have as much right out there as anyone else. My problem is with the people who just think this war is horrible and are saying nothing. A final question, and it's reserved for Ted Wolf, and I'm sure it's a setup. He just wants to know how will the Fighting Irish do this year? Um, well, first of all, you know, Lou Holtz, our f former coach, used to say an atheist uh, is a person who doesn't care whether Notre Dame wins or loses. <laughs> um, uh, uh, you, uh, I have to say, I'll speak for myself, I, I mean, the hype is so annoying. I mean, Charlie Weiss for Pope. Uh, our new coach is a remarkable uh, person. He's done some wonderful things. Coach Weiss, at the end of the Notre Dame Navy game, sent, which we won, <laughs> sent every player over to the Navy side to stand among the Navy players. He had the gold helmet standing in the middle of the Navy team as the Navy band played the Navy, uh, the Annapolis alma mater. Um, and I think uh, probably the Star Spangled Banner, I'm not sure. Uh, these, this is our new coach. This is what he does. Uh, he visited a young child who was ill. And uh, he said to the kid, you know, if we're on the three, what should we do? And the kid said, throw a pass to the right. <laughs> and they were on the three in the game. And he threw a pass to the right, and we scored. <laughs> uh, this, is a, this, is, this guy could be Rockman. I mean, we could get there. And that's his, that's his curse. You know, the poor guy has no place to go but down. I mean, we have, you know, so elevated him. But you are talking about a football team that has the toughest schedule uh, in the history of the NCAA. So um, we're, we, if, there, if, if my colleagues are on us, they'll tell you, you know, we get nervous. We get nervous. It's even almost tougher now than it was when we had those long, lean years. Now so much is expected of us. And uh, we, we just think we're going to have one heck of a season. And, a future that will, has restored, really, uh, the, glor the glory of my alma mater. <laughs> Can I make just one point, Greg, before I... 
I never thought I'd ever have Mark Russell in my audience. <laughs> and I don't know how often he's looked at his watch. Um, <laughs> but I want to thank him. He knows how I feel about him. I mean, as a, as a person who was, uh, who married into a, uh, uh, the family of a professional comedian, I, I've come to appreciate what a, tr what a really difficult thing it is to, to actually, I can't imagine, making, making your living, making people laugh, uh, can be a very painful, unpleasant experience. And, and so few people do it successfully. Mark Russell has legs, as they say in our game. The man is fresh every time I've ever I've seen him. He's new. His material is like no one else on anybody's stage. And if you're still not impressed, the guy plays the piano. Um, so, I know I'm going to pay for this, Mark. Um, <laughs> You've heard from me, though. <laughs> you heard from me. I wrote you a note. All right. <laughs> it was email. He's right. He's right on all counts. Well, a as we predicted at the beginning, this was going to be an extraordinary event with an extraordinary man. And boy, uh, on behalf of the Robert Jackson Center, I'm sure, on behalf of everybody here, you have not disappointed. Thanks right. so much, Phil Donahue. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, I hope I didn't, uh, I hope that went all right. Thank you. Thank you.